Hi everyone, um, I'm Zoe. Uh, I'll be talking about the misconceptions of open source intelligence, which is also known as OSINT. Um, I'll start off with a little bit about myself first. Um, I am from Sydney, Australia, um, which is a beautiful place surrounded by water, ocean, beaches, beautiful city, absolutely lovely. Um, I, I mean, my accent kind of gives that away a little bit. Uh, I have more recently though, I, sp I mean, I spent most of my life uh, living in Australia, um, but for the past year, I have been living in Atlanta. Um, and as you can tell, I am a complete and utter nerd. I love Comic-Con. Um, Atlanta Comic-Con is awesome. Um, but more recently, I um, actually am Senior Intelligence Analyst uh, at Dark Horse Intelligence. Um, this is kind of what my day-to-day -day job looks like. Um, this is actually very, very relevant. Um, you know, I do OSINT, I do social engineering, human intelligence, um, and, you know, even surveillance, kind of surveillance. And this is incredibly accurate of what my uh, computer and the intel that I'm grabbing is kind of constructed to be like. <laughs> On the side, I'm also a polygrapher. Um, so this is actually my husband. Uh, he volunteered, I promise. I did not hold him against his will. He volunteered for Polygraph. I thought it was pretty game of him to do that. Um, I also organized Blue Team Village, um, which we started at DEF CON 26. Uh, we did DEF CON 27, and now we're going to be back again for third year, which is awesome, at uh, DEF CON 28 slash safe mode, which will be virtual. Um, I was former director of Trace Labs and used to help run the CTFs. And now one of my more recent things that I've been doing is working on the Innocent Lives Foundation. Um, and what they actually do is they help unmask um, child predators online. So what is open source intelligence? I mean, you know, people always talk about OSINT. It's a huge buzzword. Uh, OSINT, intelligence, open source, that whole area is a huge buzzword. And, uh, you know, given the nature of layer 8, there's probably many people here that know what OSINT is. Um, so we're going to actually be digging in a little bit further than just what OSINT is, but actually be talking about, you know, what is intelligence? What makes it intelligence? Um, and then I'll be talking about conducting international OSINT um, on foreign targets. So this is kind of what you know, the impression of OSINT is, you know, social media, uh, emails, phone numbers, you know, things that you find online about people. And yeah, you know, that is that is pretty accurate, but there is actually a lot more to it than just that. Open source information, OSINT versus open source intelligence. And there is actually a key difference um, in, the dif in the definition of just, you know, collecting information on people from social media accounts to actually collecting intelligence on people. So OSINT is data collected from publicly available sources. And for those of you that are in OSINT, you'll notice that that sounds incredibly, very, very similar to the definition of OSINT. OSINT is the analysis of data collected from publicly available sources. And I think the key here is the analysis. You know, if you're going to go out and you're collecting information, um, you need just, you know, you're, you have a bunch of IP addresses, you have a bunch of mobile numbers, you have a bunch of email addresses, social media accounts, uh, Twitter handles, um, you know, it is information. But once you're actually analysing that and you're connecting the dots and you're actually giving that information some sort of relevance or context, um, that actually turns that information, the actual process of analysing it, into intelligence. Data that has beneficial insight and relevance to an objective. Um, you know, that's the best way that I try to uh, describe intelligence is, you know, you go, you have an objective, you have something that you're trying to find with a purpose. It has, a, you have a purpose, a target, um, and, you know, data, data that is relevant um, data that has insight and is actually going to be benefit to the overall objective. So this is a huge thing, link analysis. Um, you might have heard of the term six degrees of separation, and this is where it comes from. Link analysis is key in OSINT, uh, in conducting OSINT, in conducting investigations, in getting data. Uh, having that link is fundamental. Um, and is what is able to actually 
uh, make those connections. So this is, LinkedIn is amazing for this. LinkedIn is a great example of link analysis. Um, so see at the top you've got uh, John, um, first degree connection, Joe Gray, second degree connection, Jane, and the third degree connection. So what does that actually mean? And how is that relevant to OSINT? So first degree is a direct connection. So this would be like, you know, a direct colleague you work with, um, your manager, um, you know, your sister, your brother, your mum, your dad, uh, direct family members, direct friends, um, anything that you have a direct connection with, your place of work, uh, your bank, um, where you do your grocery shopping. This in LinkedIn, uh, you know, if I was to put this into a chart, this is basically a first degree connection. A second degree connection is an indirect connection. Um, so that might be, you know, someone else who uses the same bank as you or someone else who goes to, to Publix or Kroger or Walmart. You know, you've got the, uh, the, the connection because you use the same, for, you know, you, you use the same place, but you're not directly connected. Um, you're connected to the first degree though. And this is kind of where it gets a little bit more complicated um, because obviously, you know, you, you hear the term six degrees of separation. And that is because there are six degrees of, you know, connections that you can have. And in terms of LinkedIn, this is what that would look like. Um, so, you know, for, for example, here, uh, John is my first degree connection. Joe is John's first degree connection. And because of that, Joe is my second degree connection. And so you can imagine that the more degrees back uh, you go, the more complicated it gets. And so the reason why this is relevant is because, you know, if you're, if you're conducting, uh, you know, intelligence on uh, a particular target or a subject, you don't just want their first degree connections. You want to know who are they connected to through other people. If you're looking at malicious actors, um, or if you're looking at, you know, fish fishing attacks, there are probably multiple degrees of, con of connections that go back further than just the first degree. So then there's, uh, you know, the last kind of major degree is the third degree, which is an indirect connection, but it's directly connected to the second degree. And this chart looks a little bit crazy. I won't lie, it was, it's a lot to take in. This is what this looks like. <laughs> um, so you've got Jane, who is a first degree connection of Joe, Joe, who's a first degree connection of John, and then John, who's a first degree connection of me. And so because of that, Joe is my, first, my second degree connection, Jane is John's second degree connection, and Jane is my third degree connection. Um, and this is really relevant when you're conducting any form of intelligence gathering. Um, you know, as I had mentioned, you know, uh, you know, there are multiple forms of, um, you know, links. Um, you know, it could be a link might be people that you went to high school with. Um, you know, a, a teacher that taught you in college. It could be a previous manager. It could be uh, the place that you bought your car from. Um, and having, you know, when you're conducting um, any form of intelligence, even when you're conducting, you know, pen tests, these links is what, uh, you know, gets us more intelligence and helps us kind of build those, uh, build those building blocks to, you know, gathering information and building up a bit, a bit more of a profile of someone. In the other, in another aspect, I guess it's also what helps, you know, directly connect people to certain things. You know, it, it helps what uh, helps with, um, say, for instance, you have, um, you know, you have someone that has robbed a bank, right? Having that first degree connection is what helps you, you know, not just be, uh, not just have a suspect, but helps you actually be like, yeah, that person did do it because they have a first degree connection. Uh, you know, because of this or because of that, because, um, you know, maybe they had, um, you know, maybe they were a user, um, they, you know, there's so many different degrees there. This is actually the most common, that common form of, um, you know, link analysis that we would, should all be familiar with, you know, an organization chart, company structures, um, you know, this is uh, just using it in day-to-day -day life. 
So link analysis is actually what turns information into intelligence. If you have, you know, uh, if you have, uh, as I had said, you know, a bank robbery. If you have a bank robbery and you have uh, 10 suspects, having that link is actually what helps you narrow down from those 10 sub suspects to maybe eight suspects or five suspects to then eventually down to one suspect. It's that, that link is what turns intelligence also into evidence. You know, in OSINT, we need evidence of things. You know, we can't just go out and go, yep, I think this might be this person's mobile number, not sure, not 100% sure, might be, could be. You know, having that direct link is what turns a maybe into a yes, this is definitely that person's mobile number. So just to kind of break it up a bit, uh, you know, before I go into the next section, um, I thought I'd do a little bit of an exercise. Um, so this is uh, my husband and I walking our dog. Um, I actually posted this on Twitter a couple months ago and just for the fun of it, I was like, where am I? <laughs> um, and I didn't actually think I was going to get so many people direct message me the exact geo coordinates of where I was standing. Um, it kind of, you know, being an intelligence, like I obviously, you know, I do geospatial intelligence and I was like, yes, of course, you know, people can locate me. But actually having a bunch of people, uh, you know, inbox you, your longitude and latitude was a little bit creepy. So I thought I would put that in here because I wanted to actually go through the steps, um, you know, that some people took and the steps that I would take, um, you know, as an investigator. If I just had an image um, and I wanted to kind of, you know, work out whereabouts is this person. So to also note, some people had a bit of an advantage because some of them actually knew me and they kind of knew what area I lived in. But there was like five or six people who didn't know me at all and they were still able to get it. Um, so I actually kind of spoke to all of them, worked out like, you know, what methods and strategies did you use? And then I also conducted those same methods and strategies myself. So that way I could also come to the same conclusion. And yes, it is absolutely possible to work out, you know, not knowing me at all, you can work out exactly where I am standing. Um, and I'm going to go through just some basic steps of how I did that. So oh, let me go back. Sorry, let me go back. Um, okay. So First of all, just looking at this image, there are a few key things. Um, well, first of all, it's sunset, which probably doesn't tell us too much. Uh, it's winter, the leaves, well, it could be winter or fall or maybe early spring. Um, you know, there's no leaves on the tree. Um, there's some buildings in the background. Um, you know, you might better zoom in and see what some of those uh, names are. There's nothing too obvious there, but overall, the biggest first indicator was the cars. Um, so some of you might know um, that in the United States, uh, depending on what state you are living in, it is not required to have a number plate on the front of your car. Um, I think there is, uh, I think there's 20 states, 20 states out of the 50 that do not require license plates on the front. Um, <clears throat> That will, was a really big indicator and a really big play into how these people were able to also locate. The other one is the building in the back um, is a First Citizens Bank. Um, it's super, super blurry. But if you like ultra zoom in, you can barely read it. Like just if you squint a little bit, you might just be able to read it. But yes, it is a First Citizens Bank. And so I'm going to start with there. So knowing it's a First Citizens Bank, I just straight up went to Google and type in First Citizens Bank. And what do you know? They only operate in 18 states and the District of Columbia. So that actually, for a start, is if you were to get a map of America and just cross out, you know, every single state they don't operate in, you're left with 18 states and DC. So that's a really good indicator already. So from there, I, knowing that the cars don't actually have number plates on the front, uh, as you can tell from the previous image, uh, all of those cars, there are no number plates on the front. So I was able to narrow that down to the circled states. Um, so how I did that was I just, you know, I just went and uh, geo, just went to the website of First Citizens and looked at what states do they operate in. And then I just got this map and just kind of overlaid the states that they operate in versus the states that only require a back license plate. 
Um, so you can see there's, there's still not too many. Um, the numbers next to the circles are actually how many branches they have in that state. So Arizona had three branches, Kansas only has one branch, Oklahoma has two, um, you know, more on the East Coast, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, they all had 10 branches uh, in those states. So we're still left with a really, really wide chunk. Um, but considering that there are 50 states, I think we've done so far a pretty good job at narrowing it down to one, two, three, four, five, six, about 10 states. Um, so from there, what I actually did, uh, this is a bit of a long process. Um, and there are, you know, in OSINT, there are going to be some manual things. Unfortunately, you can't automate everything, um, you know, and there might be a tool that can do this possibly that I don't know about. Um, but in this aspect, this next bit was really, really manual. Um, it only took about three hours to complete though. So it wasn't too, too lengthy, but it worked. Um, you know, it actually did work. So if you're looking for something that's effective, um, you might have to be a little bit patient with how long it's going to take you to get that information. So I actually went to Google Maps um, and I started in Florida. Um, haven't been to Florida, want to go to Florida, so I thought why not, why not start with Florida. Um, and I just went to the First Citizens Bank website in Florida, brought up all their 10 branches and started going through uh, just individually, one by one, what are the surrounding suburbs? Like, what are the surrounding, um, you know, what's what, what's surrounding it? As you can see, there's palm trees, uh, the roof is red, there's some beautiful bushes outside, it was on a main road. Um, <clears throat> so going back to the other image, um, if I go back two slides, so looking at that and comparing it, I could straight away tell, as someone who's done this, um, you know, as someone who is maybe potentially new into looking at images to finding locations, it might take you a little bit longer. Um, but for me, uh, as I've done this quite a few times before, I could straight away tell that that is definitely not the same place. That is not the same building. Even though it looks very similar, it's not the same building. Um, and the indicators for that where there are no palm trees, um, you know, if you actually go to uh, Google Maps and really zoom in on that building, there's not a single palm tree. There's also no palm trees surrounding as well. And the big indicator was the colour of the roof. Um, the colour of the roof in this particular image is uh, like, a, like a navy blue, black, maybe grey colour. Um, in this image, it is red and it's a term completely different building. So I did that for each location. So yes, in Florida, there were 10 locations. So I did that for each of the 10 locations in Florida. And then I did that for all the locations in you know, Oklahoma, um, basically all of, all of these states that have a number next to it. I went to each individual location on Google Maps and basically went, is this it? And yeah, there are, there's probably quicker ways to do it. Um, you know, you could have a look at, uh, you know, the, maybe the temperatures in that time and say, you know, uh, you know, this particular person was wearing jeans. Um, you know, they were in a short sleeve t-shirt though, which means at that particular time, even though it's winter, it must not have been too cold. So there are probably other ways you could narrow it down. Um, but for me personally, I found, um, you know, as an analyst, for me, the most effective way was to just go one by one from start to finish, you know, start at Arizona, then go to New Mexico, Kansas, Oklahoma, Tennessee, and make your way down until you've basically looked at all of these buildings to identify whether or not that is the building. And as I had said, yes, it is a long process. Um, this took about three hours to do in total, um, could have taken longer, but uh, at the end of the day, I achieved the result that I was looking for and it was somewhat effective. So moving forward, this was another place, uh, Atlanta Dunwoody. I was able to tell that this is not it as well. Um, the color of the roof is the same. So I, I looked at it for a little bit and I'm thinking maybe, you know, maybe this could be it. They've also got across the road, they've got the grassy, uh, the grassy field as well. Looks to be, you know, near some main roads. It, you know, it could be. Um, but further zooming in, if I were to zoom in on this photo, um, it's actually a red brick building and it's not very obvious unless you look at the chimney and, uh, you know, some of the bricks there, but yeah, it is actually a red brick building. And as I had indicated, this building is not red bricks. 
So moving on to the final one, uh, this is where I, I was, this big grassy uh, oval paddock looking thing here is where I was standing. Um, and as someone who is has come across this image, there are ways that you can identify and confirm that using the surrounding buildings. Um, you know, for starters, this, the actual Cumberland building um, that is listed up here, we can look at that and we can look at the colour of the paint, the colour of the roof, um, how many stories is it? We can see it's a, it's roughly got four stories because there's, you know, there's four, four windows going vertical. Um, little, little key factors like this um, we can use to identify. The other thing is this, um, in the middle of the screen, um, just near the paddock, there's a big apartment complex um, and the bottom of the apartment complex looks like it's red. There's like a big red strip. Um, so we're actually able to use different different paint colours, different styles of trees, um, you know, all of those different aesthetics to determine and confirm if this is the location. So going back, I actually used uh, this red building here um, in the middle of the screen, the big, big apartment complex that has the red building, the red colour along the bottom of it. I was able to confirm that that is the same building as the image as the building just on the right here, near where the cars are. That's the same, uh, you know, it has the same aesthetic. It has the white paint up the top um, and then the red, the red brick down the bottom. So those were some steps that I took. And as I said, you know, you can do this on many, many images. Obviously, there's images that are going to be harder than that. Um, but really, it was just to demonstrate that it is possible, and it kind of surprised me having so many people inbox me my location. Um, I was like, well, okay, that was kind of creepy. <laughs> so the next thing is International OSIN, and I'm talking outside of the US. Um, so as I had indicated, I am not from the United States, I'm actually Australian. Um, and so I learnt OSINT I didn't learn how to do OSINT on people within Australia first. I actually learned how to do international OSINT first. Um, you know, when I was in Australia, lots of the people that I was doing OSINT on were in other countries. They were in America, they were in Canada, they're in Japan or China, or they're in Europe somewhere, London. Um, and it actually kind of got to my attention that there are some really common um, Common mistakes that people are making when they are conducting international OSINT, for starters, one of the biggest things is because it is international, it's something you're not familiar with. You know, you're told to go out and look for OSINT on someone who is in another country. And, you know, you living is, for example, me currently living in America at the moment, you know, I, you know, you might not know much about other countries or you might not know what tools they use or social media platforms they use. Um, and yeah, it was actually, um, it was definitely an interesting experience learning international OSINT first over just OSINT within within the US and, and now obviously Australia. Um, so I thought I'd give a bit of a, um, a bit of a, uh, some examples of ways that will make your life and your searching so, so much easier when doing international um, targets. And the same also goes with not just people, like, you know, if the person is international, but also like international companies. International companies operate completely different. Like, you know, there, yes, there might be, uh, for example, Microsoft. Micro there's a Microsoft in Australia, there's a Microsoft in New Zealand, there's a Microsoft in the US, there's probably one in Canada, but each one will probably, in, like, you know, operate completely different um, because the countries operate differently. And it can be a bit overwhelming, um, especially, you know, if you're not sure where to start. Um, so hopefully this will help clarify some things in that aspect. So <laughs> this is the one that I have learned the most is do not append the country named for search. And what I mean by that is this, um, you know, when you're, when you're in a, um, a country doing, you know, if I was to just type in social media sites, you know, typically people doing OSINT, I've seen it so, so many times, they'll just depend the country name. Like, you know, social media, like top 10 social media sites in Europe, top 10 social media sites in Australia, top 10 social media sites in the US. 
Um, and it is accurate to an extent. Like, yes, you are going to get some results of social media sites that are used in China, social media sites that are used in Australia. Um, but the biggest thing is that Google knows where you are. Um, you know, Google knows, okay, so you're in the United States and you want to know the top 10 social media sites in China. So we're going to give you the top 10 social media sites that Americans probably use, that also Chinese people probably use. So you will probably get things like WhatsApp, uh, Kik, um, your more typical uh, social media sites and platforms that Americans and Chinese people collectively use. Same thing if you were doing it in, you know, in Europe, um, you'll get a, a combination but you're not going to actually get the information as if you're a local, you know, and that's the biggest thing is when you're conducting, uh, you know, international OSINT, you want it as if you're a local person there. You don't want to kind of hear it through some, get information through a third party kind of uh, source. You want it through this, like, you know, an actual source of that country. For example, if I was to conduct international OSINT in, on an Australian company, you know, I would, uh, let's just say for the same, it's a business. Um, I would want to actually go to an Australian website and get the information off an Australian site about that company, um, not off a American website that's talking about how Australia does things. There is a bit of a difference there, um, you know, because uh, you know, you're hearing it, I guess, as a saying, you're hearing it directly from the horse's mouth. I don't know if that's a common saying over here. Um, but essentially, you're, you're hearing it from an actual local entity who lives in that country. Um, and that actually is a really, really big factor of the intelligence that you're getting. <clears throat> so I went to, you know, social media sites in China. Um, and you get stuff, you get stuff like this, um, you know, you get your WeChat, you get your, uh, Badoo, and yes, as I had said to an extent, you know, some of this is actually accurate, but you'll find that this is more your kind of, uh, it's more aimed for, you know, the wider community, whereas you want to use what the, you want to use and have access to what the locals are using. Um, you know, they they have, there's so many different platforms. Um, it is absolutely ridiculous the amount of different platforms that are out there that we don't even know about. Um, like, you know, it is overwhelming the amount of data and information and sites and websites that we can get intelligence off. Um, and I think that will really actually help us uh, in terms of making these results more accurate. Use a reliable VPN. And it's actually not for the purpose that you're thinking of. Typically, yes, in cybersecurity and OSINT, we use VPNs all the time. Um, you know, we'll put a VPN in into Europe or a totally different country. Um, and typically, you know, we use that because we don't, we want to hide our we want to hide our footsteps. And that makes complete sense. Um, but in the realm of OSINT, you don't want to put your VPN in just any country. Um, you want to put it in the country that you're doing OSINT in. So say, for instance, if I am in, a, in the United States of America and I'm doing OSINT on Sydney, Australia, I'm not going to go and put my VPN in Brisbane or Perth or Melbourne. That just wouldn't make any sense. I would put my VPN in Sydney. And the reason for that um, is because, once again, it goes back to that whole, you know, you get the local, uh, the local information. Because, you know, Google all of a sudden goes, oh, hey, actually, you are actually in Sydney. Um, you know, we're going to give you stuff as if you actually live there. It's that whole kind of, you're not looking at information from a third party. You're actually getting that information directly. And obviously, depending on what your target is, this would vary. So the other thing is, um, you know, ha having that, there are other ways to do it as well. Um, so you can actually know that Google has settings and other uh, web browsers have settings where you can actually go into the settings and you can change the country you're in. Um, and I haven't actually like, you know, reliably tested that myself to see if there is a difference in the results. But I can 
110% confirm that if you are conducting OSINT and you have your VPN in a different country um, other than what you're conducting the OSINT in, it will impact your searches. Um, yes, you're probably still going to find some awesome stuff, but it will be so much more easier having your VPN uh, in the right place. And that's something that people don't really think about. Um, I was helping a, um, a friend of mine with some OSINT stuff and I, you know, he had his VPN in, set into like Russia and the, yet the country that he was conducting OSINT on was London and I just, I couldn't work out, um, you know, uh, you know, you, you get a lot better uh, information, a lot more relevant information, a lot more accurate information being in that actual country. <laughs> so, okay, this is a funny one. This is, this is a bit of a funny one. Um, <laughs> Uh, this goes back to the whole VPN thing. Um, Google and artificial intelligence and machine learning, let me tell you, this stuff is, that. yeah, it's clever as hell. It is, it is sneaky, it is clever, and you wouldn't even realise that it's all there um, until I had moved to countries that I really was like, wow, like the stuff that I'm now exposed to on Google is totally different. Um, so this is a classic example of why you need to have your VPN or your uh, country settings in the location of where you are doing your intelligence. So I currently have, I just, I didn't have a VPN on at this time. Um, I went to Google. So obviously I'm in America. So Google's like, hey, you're in America. I went to Google and I typed in a picture, which some people call a jug. Um, here apparently it's called a picture um, and of course we're in America Google knows and you know artificial intelligence machine learning they know the language we use they know what we in North America call things and they have adapted for that they have learned off that and they have actually intentionally <laughs> changed our searches to you know really reflect what they think we're wanting to search um, so I typed in picture and I got a picture. I changed my VPN to Australia. Um, and from those of you that are from like, that might be listening that are from Europe or Australia or New Zealand, um, as you would know, we don't call it a picture, we call it a jug. Um, and so of course, when I went to Australia, had with my VPN in, a, in Sydney and I typed in a picture, I got the picture plant because we don't call it a picture, it's a jug. Um, and this is this goes back to um, you know the whole aspect of knowing what knowing everything about the country that you're wanting to conduct intelligence on. Um, you don't want to just be looking. You know, you, we don't. You don't want to be on the outskirt just looking in. You want to be in there, knowing exactly what the locals are using, knowing what the locals eat, knowing you know do they catch buses, trains. You know, obviously this varies on your objective what is it that you're wanting to get in like you know open source intelligence on um but this this is a really really common error um you know people aren't aware of the of the language differences and so when you're searching for things um you know you might not be using the right terminology or the right words and because google's picking you up in a particular location it will change your results so I put my this I put the VPN in Japan and I put in picture and same thing of course I got a Japanese picture but this time it was an actual baseball picture and this you know this just goes to show how much um, our how much our information is actually tailored to what we type in what we know and where we are um, and with open source intelligence, we want to narrow that down to be very, very specific, you know. Um, so it's yeah, just a classic example. And obviously, you know, if we were to change the VPN to another to another um, another country, the same thing would occur. And just to state, all three of these, I put in the exact same word, just picture, and complete different results. So you got to know the local language. Um, you know, if you're if you're looking for things, um, knowing what the common terminology 
is, is going to help you. Because a lot of the things that, uh, you know, different countries use different abbreviations. That's a huge one. Um, I know that the UK and Australia and New Zealand and a lot of Europe abbreviate the hell out of everything. Everything's abbreviated. Um, and if you're looking for something and it's abbreviated, you're going to miss it because you don't know what the abbreviation is. Um, and it's it's doing like the, the research on that country prior to just jumping in to uh, into the conducting your overall OSINT. So almost you want to almost do like a pre like a pre investigation prior to your OSINT. You know you want to go into your OSINT knowing everything. You know you want to know everything about the demograph. You want to know about the population. Um, you want to know yeah everything. And this is a this is something that I have discovered um, with companies and many other organisations. The whole abbreviation thing is an issue. So if you you know if you have your VPN in uh, set into the USA and you just type in a CRN, you're going to get your you know all of your business documents, that company, your customer registration number, I believe is what that stands for. Um, and the difference is, is that different countries do things completely differently. And so thus they have different protocols, different procedures, different words, different terminology. They have different places where you're going to find information. Um, you know, it's, it is difficult doing international OSIN, especially if you're using like public databases in different countries where you're not really sure you know, what information you're going to get from there um, or what to really look for. So going going in, knowing what you're going to look for, knowing the correct terminology is going to, it's going to save you so much time. Um, so in Australia, we use an ABN number, um, Australian business number. Russia, they have a different one, um, OGRN slash EGRUL. -E uh, Mongolia uses a SIL number. Um, so this, knowing, knowing all this stuff is going to help a lot. Um, <clears throat> so classic example of the VPN situation again. Um, it really, it really is a hindrance, like, you know, not, not being aware of that kind of stuff because it is going to screw up your results. It's going to, um, change the information you'll get, um, and it's not going to be as accurate. So here I have... Uh, I don't actually have a VPN set, so locations are set to the United States. I type in an ABN, which is an Australian business number, and of course it doesn't come up because we're in America, and it doesn't. It's not going to look for that sort of stuff. I change my VPN to Australia, and suddenly the second, the second one, ABN lookup. So there we're actually getting the results of what we actually want, and this is how. Um, you know, your search, it, it, this is how your searches, even um, other searches like Yahoo um, and Bing do the exact same thing, um, which is frustrating. Um, Doingbusiness.org is an awesome, 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 awesome website. Um, I highly, highly recommend it. Uh, you can get some amazing resources on every single country. Um, you can work out, okay, so what uh, if you're doing OSINT on a particular business um, and you know what countries they operate in, you can actually then go to doingbusiness.org and see the different requirements of a business, what's actually required to register that business, what's required to start up that business. And you just pick um, you just pick the country they're in and it tells you everything. You know, it tells you what type of um, what type of, do they use an ABN number? Do they use a CRN? Do they use a VAT number? Um, they tell you everything you possibly know, which is awesome. Not everyone uses Google, um, and this for some might be hard to believe, but there's actually a huge population that don't use Google, um, which is actually, as an O center, is beneficial. Um, and the reason for this is because we, you know, part of what we're looking for is we're looking for intelligence, we're looking for evidence, we're looking for links to things. Um, and, 
you know, we may not be able to find something on Google. Maybe there's a particular website that hasn't been crawled or web scraped by Google. But hey, you know, if we go over to Bing or Yahoo, maybe their web crawlers have actually crawled that site that Google hasn't. Um, so always check different search engines um, because there's going to be totally different sets of data. Things that are on Google, maybe Yahoo and Bing haven't crawled and they don't have. Things that are missing from Google, maybe other web browsers and sorry, other search engines do have. Um, and I have found this super, super beneficial. Um, the amount of times that I have looked um, outside of the realms of Google and have actually found what I'm looking for, um, you know, I highly recommend if, if, if you search Google and it's not there, don't give up. You know, just go back in, you know, try different search engines, try different web browsers, um, and, you know, it, you'll, you'll find something. So going back to not everyone uses Google, every country has their own kind of default search engine, uh, which is crazy actually, um, knowing that there are so many different search engines out there that have a preference over Google um, is, is just crazy to comprehend. Really Google is used in you know Australia, New Zealand, uh, and all of North America. But outside North America, Australia, and New Zealand, um, there are so many other search engines out there that are actually of preference. Um, I know that in the kind of the UK region, London, the EU, their preference is Yahoo. Um, <clears throat> Korea, they use Naver. Uh, China, Badu, Czech Republic. Um, a lot of them use Sesnum. Russia, Yandex, Sweden use uh, Enairo, France. France has a good option. They have Bing, Orange, and Voila. Voila. So they have a really good variety there of other search engines we can use. And this goes back to knowing your subject, knowing uh, knowing where they're from, and actually really honing into that location. Yahoo. As I had said, a lot a lot of people outside Australia, New Zealand, and North America use Yahoo. I was actually really surprised when I was, you know, doing some research and reading statistics about it. Um, I haven't used Yahoo for ever. I don't think I've ever used Yahoo um, other than, you know, obviously conducting OSINT. Um, but for like personal usages, I have never personally used Yahoo. So I thought it was quite surprising actually. So this is obviously a map of the world. So the blue, um, the blue, that has, you know, Australia, New Zealand, um, you know, a little bit uh, parts of, you know, the, the North African regions, um, North America, Alaska, Canada regions. Um, those are countries that primarily use Facebook Messenger um, as their number one source of communication. Um, I mean, most people have Facebook Messenger, you know, because it's, it's common here. Um, but the thing is that we have to, you know, when conducting OSINT, we have to be aware that not everyone is like our culture. Not everyone uses culturally the same tools and technologies that we use. Um, and every culture, every country uh, has their own preference. Um, these green, the green bits, um, they primarily use things like Kick and WeChat and WhatsApp um, and like other chat platforms that aren't really as as commonly used. Um, the purple, they have their own complete um, chat platform that I hadn't even heard of, that they just use in that particular part of the world. And I thought that was crazy that just that little section has their, has their own complete section. So when you're doing your OSINT uh, and you can't find someone on Facebook and you can't find someone on LinkedIn and you can't find someone on Snapchat or Instagram, um, you have to think, what does that culture and country use? Um, because yeah, you know, in North America, uh, we use Snapchat and we use Instagram and you know, everyone has Facebook, um, but you gotta remember not necessarily the rest of the world does. Um, as I've as I've said many times, it is different depending on the cultures. Um, I believe uh, Russia. So uh, the, I don't even know how to pronounce that. Uh, the Contake. I don't know how you say that, but 
that is basically their version of Facebook. So if you're looking for someone in Russia and then on Facebook, have a look there because the chances are you will probably find them on there. Um, same with Korea. They have, you know, Naver. Naver was also a, um, a, a search engine. So Naver seems to be a search engine and is also um, a social media platform. So, you know, those types of platforms are critical uh, when, when searching. Um, China uses Dubin, uh, France. Um, so via, via Dio is like the, their version of LinkedIn. Um, so yeah, you will probably find some people from France who are on LinkedIn. Um, but a lot of the population probably would use more of their own local stuff. Um, and I, I cannot stress this enough. You have to know the country as if you're a local. You have to think, okay, well, you know, I'm conducting intelligence from the United States, but I'm going to try and put myself as if I am in that country. Um, so, you know, what, what methods of transportation do they use uh, in Japan? What methods of, um, of transportation do they use in New Zealand, in Australia, and in the UK? Um, you know, you have to really think about those because when you're conducting intelligence, knowing those things is going to benefit your searches. Because, you know, if you know that most people in Sydney use uh, an Opal card, um, which most people here probably have no idea what an Opal card is. Um, but yeah, in Australia, we use this thing called an Opal card. You can track everything through the Opal card. Um, and so if you're looking for someone in, in, in Australia, and you want to track someone, the first place you would look is the Opal card. But you wouldn't know that unless you were to put yourself into the position of being into that country. Um, so you have to really, really embrace, embrace the different cultures there and really work out, um, like, you know, what, what do they, you know, what do they eat for breakfast? Do they use Uber? Do they use Uber Eats? You know, there's so many different uh, variables there and obviously this is completely dependent on what your target is um, you know if your target is a company um, you know you want to start looking into um, you know business requirements um, because that's a really really big one where it's different in every single country um, whereas if you're actually looking for a person you know knowing the local social media platforms <clears throat> This is an awesome site. Okay, this is a fantastic site. I use it all the time. iintelligence.eu. It's a European site. It is amazing. Makes my life so much easier and it'll make your life easier too. So companies, here you go. Here's an amazing, amazing resource. If you're doing OSINT on companies, company research links, depending on what location you're in, the EU, the UK, US, Switzerland, Middle East, every country you could possibly think of. Um, but the same thing as well for national search engines. Um, as I had said, not everyone uses Google and we need to really think outside of the square when conducting intelligence um, because there's just so many overwhelming platforms that we can look through. So here's an awesome list. Um, definitely uh, head on over to that website, European site, and download the PDF document that they have. It's incredible. There's like 170 pages of foreign information, websites, URLs, links, pages, uh, blogs, chats, everything you'd possibly want. Um, and lastly, questions. Um, I know that you guys don't have the ability to type questions into here. Um, so if anyone does have any questions, if you head on into the Discord channel, um, and go to uh, track one um, and just feel free to just post any questions you have into track one. That would be awesome. Um, it would be best if you didn't direct message me any questions. The reason for that is because if multiple people have the same question, I can then, uh, you know, answer that question um, in one hit. Cool. Great. Thanks everyone for uh, joining in and I hope you all got something beneficial out of it. Um, feel free to follow me on LinkedIn and on Twitter as well. Uh, my handle is just globally uh, verbal. Um, so feel free to follow me on there. Thanks so much for your time.